On a cold morning in rural Wisconsin, hunters find a woman frozen in a creek, and though detectives chip away at the ice, the case never thaws. Dead in the water, detectives call the young girl Fond du Lac Jane Doe, and to this day, she remains nameless. Sunday, November 23rd, 2008. Icy winds bore down upon the rural farmlands and forests of Fond du Lac County, Wisconsin. Detective Jerry Kane of the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Office indulged in breakfast with his family on his morning off. His fellow officer, Lieutenant Cameron McGee, braved the weather in a tree stand in nearby Clark County, waiting for unsuspecting deer to walk by. Then, at 8 a.m., McGee receives a call from fellow deer hunters in his jurisdiction, but Tony Schraufnagel and his friends phone about a different kind of doe. In a small creek cutting through an abandoned farm off of Skyline Drive, approximately a mile north of Highway 28, the hunters stumble upon a clothed female body face down encased in ice. Soon, McGee and Detective Kane are on the scene with fellow officers. Braving the cold winds and frigid waters, investigators worked for hours, meticulously chipping away at the ice around the body, searching the creek bed, and sifting through the sediment for any clues. But as the sun set, the temperature plummeted, refreezing the creek, and snow began to fall. Though police have no more idea of the girl's identity than when they started, they're forced to leave, a sense of heaviness following them one that would haunt their department for years to come. From the crime scene, Detective Kane felt he was about to embark on his first homicide assignment. Even after obtaining a search warrant for the surrounding farmland and going over security cameras from the adult video store down the road, they found nothing of value. While the medical examiner performed the autopsy, the sheriff's office released descriptions of the clothing and the girl's appearance to surrounding law enforcement agencies and media outlets. They distributed flyers and slogged through the multiple missing persons, vehicle, and wanted persons profiles without any luck. Calls from worried family members flooded the department, wondering if Jane Doe was their missing runaway daughter. Tips were filed into a spreadsheet, each one followed to its end without any progress. Because months passed without any new clues, authorities suspected Jane Doe wasn't from the area. They hoped the autopsy could confirm their suspicions, but Jane Doe's body tells them next to nothing about who she is and what happened to her. Even though Doe was in an advanced state of decomposition, forensic entomologist Neil Haskell effectively utilized weather data and insect traces to determine she was likely dumped in the creek two to four months earlier, between July and September. Decomposition destroyed any scars, wounds, tattoos, or piercings Jane Doe may have had in life, making it difficult to determine her cause of death, which law enforcement claims they've never conclusively figured out. The medical examiner used muscle tissue to run a toxicology test, but the results have never been revealed to the public. There's been no mention of any sexual assault either. What police have ruled out is suicide, and they believe foul play may have led to her death. Authorities had to work with what they did know. Doe was anywhere from 15 to 21 years old, stood between 4 feet 10 inches to 5 feet 4 inches tall, and had an average frame between 110 and 135 pounds. Her hair hung 12 to 14 inches long with highlights, but her natural hair color could have been a light brown or dark blonde. It's possible she was knock-kneed or pigeon-toed, which might have given her a distinct gait. She also had spina bifida occulta, where one or more of the vertebrae are malformed, but it can be asymptomatic and she may have been unaware of it. There was also a fully healed fracture to one of her ribs, possibly indicating an accident earlier in her life. 
She had a slight overbite and had sealants on four of her upper molars and fillings on four of the lower ones, so it's thought she had access to dental care. The greatest debate concerning Jane Doe's appearance is her ethnicity. Based on her bones, anthropologists at the University of Wisconsin determined she was possibly Hispanic, Asian, or Native American, though this is a best guess based on the method most commonly used to narrow down race using bones. Police speculated she was possibly Caucasian, but a biracial profile can't be ruled out either. Detectives tracked down Jane Doe's clothing to the chain Family Dollar. The black strapless top, size small, with a pink trim and bow was sold in the spring of 2008, and the bra, size 36C, and underwear, size large, were sold sometime in early to mid-July that same year. Her Angel brand jeans, size 3, were cuffed at the bottom, possibly purchased at a Kohl's store. Some online sleuthers propose that the clothing might have come from a local Deb's store as well. All of the items appeared in newer condition, but Fond du Lac authorities were especially puzzled by the different sizes. I know for me personally, my size and clothing depends on the brand I'm buying, and the range of sizes I fit into is anywhere from a small to a large, depending, so I don't find it particularly strange, but detectives did find it odd. Jane Doe also had a single dark ponytail tie on her wrist, which is also very common to me. Most women I know that have longer hair have a hairband on their wrist. It's just convenient. Earlier reports about the case said Jane Doe sported a bracelet with various pendants on it, but in more recent reports it hasn't been mentioned, so I'm unsure of this detail's origin or its validity. Fox 6 News brought an expert metal detector, Paul Humphreys, to the scene where the body was found and uncovered a penny-sized St. Benedict medal in the creek's water. However, it couldn't be conclusively tied to Jane Doe. A reconstruction of what Jane Doe may have looked like in life garnered statewide attention, and after sifting through over 200 tips, only three seemed promising. A young woman named Brittany Peart vanished from Maryland in July of 2008, but DNA confirmed that she was not Jane Doe, and her body was found later in 2011. Then, in June 2009, police thought Doe might have been Chantal Tobler, a runaway, but she was found safe in 2011. For a while, authorities thought Connie McAllister, who went missing from Wisconsin in 2004, was a potential match, but she was found alive in Mexico in 2013. Working through a list of over 150 potential matches without much luck left the sheriff's office frustrated, but they were far from quitting. They entered Doe's DNA into every database they could find and sent her picture to media outlets all over the country, hoping they would spread the word, and they even attempted to take the search into Mexico. Kane managed to get Doe's case featured on a deck of cold case playing cards, which were made specifically to distribute to state prisons with the hope someone behind bars had more information. It's been almost a decade since the Fond du Lac Jane Doe was heartlessly dumped in a creek, yet the case remains largely under the radar of large media outlets and has gone utterly cold. As we know, a lack of answers leads to an abundance of speculation. We've discussed the three cases detectives ruled out through DNA, but to date, there are an additional 31 rule-outs for Fond du Lac Jane Doe. The following girls are not Jane Doe, and I'll be listing them by state, name, and the year they disappeared. All of these girls are still missing. From California, Sarita Camacho, 2008, Samantha Goodwin, unknown, Diana Mazariegos, 2006, Aaron Rogers, 2007, Cynthia Young, 2008. From Florida, Kyla Porter, 2008, Tiffany Sessions, 1989. From Illinois, Yasmin Acree, 2008, Jamie Harper, 2007, and Stacy Peterson, 2007. From Massachusetts, Maura Murray, 2004. From Michigan, Mindy Arnett, 2002, and Nashida Shandara, 2007. From Minnesota, Katiri Michau, 2007, and Victoria Aukzinski, 1990. From Missouri, Dana Bruce, 2008. Nevada, Devonay Pingle, 2007. 
New Hampshire, Bethany Sinclair, 2001, New Mexico, Leah Peebles, 2006, and Tiffany Reed, 2004. From Oklahoma, J.C. K. Wakela, 2008. From Puerto Rico, Stephanie Pineda Morales, 2008. From Tennessee, Shannon Arif, 1998, and Christina Branham, 2006. From Virginia, Patricia Schmidt, 1985. From Wisconsin, Audrey Backberg, 1962. Sarah Bushland, 1996. Madeline Edmond, 2005. Stacy Rudolph, 2000. Amber Wild, 1998. And from Canada, in Manitoba, Claudette Osborne, 2008. All of these have been ruled out as the Fond du Lac Jane Doe. On the flip side, the Grateful Doe subreddit has kept an extensive list of girls users have suggested could possibly be Jane Doe, compiled by the user Zombie Gray, so special thanks to them. One woman, Alicia Digna, has been submitted for consideration to detectives. Alicia went missing from Michigan in August 2008, and it's unknown if law enforcement has compared DNA samples yet. These are Sleuther's suggested possible matches to Jane Doe that have yet to be submitted. Within the United States, from Arizona, Ramona Felix, 2003. From California, Stefania Campos, 2007. Jacqueline Isabel Carrillo, 2004. Estefani Castro, 2008. Gabriela Gonzalez, 2002. Flora Toralva, 2003. From Connecticut, Griselda Aguirre, 2008. From Florida, Anayeli Garcia Millen, unknown. Rebecca Jose, unknown. Yancis Maciel Juarez, 2002. Gabriela Medina, 2006. Cristina Velasquez, 2006. From Georgia, Alejandra Nava, 2003. From Hawaii, Christian Sedeno, 2003. From Iowa, Jeannie Hernandez, 2005. From Maryland, Sarah Castillo, 2008. From Michigan, Stasia Jarrell, unknown. From Nevada, Gloria Aguilar, 2008. From New Jersey, Francesca Sugel Martinez, 2000. And Michela Sugel Martinez, 2000. From New York, Leanne Hausberg, 1999. From North Carolina, Diana Isabel Gonzalez, 2005. From South Carolina, Viridiana Maldonado, 2007. From Tennessee, Ricarda Tillman Lockett, 2007. From Texas, Monica Carrasco, 2003. Margaret Quadi, 2001. Abigail Estrada, 2007. Veronica Gallegos, 2005. Irma Gomez, 2004. And Lucero Sorabia, 2004. From Washington, Danica Childs, 2007. And out of Canada, in Alberta, Chantelle Bouchy, 2007. And out of Quebec, Sarah Maldonado, 2007. The most recent speculation not included in this list is Trudy Leanne Appleby, suggested by users on the Web Sleuths forums. Trudy disappeared in August of 1996 from Illinois, and William Ed Smith, a friend of the Appleby family, was named a suspect just last year. Smith passed away in 2014, but a witness saw him with Trudy before she vanished. Fond du Lac Jane Doe was estimated to be between 15 to 21 years old, and Trudy was born in 1984, making her slightly older than the speculated age. But many people find similarities in their appearances, both at the age of 11 when Trudy went missing and her aged composites. We don't know Jane Doe's eye color, and it's hard to compare heights and weights since Trudy was 11 when she disappeared. The dates are also a little bit of a stretch. Trudy went missing 12 years prior to when Jane Doe's body was dumped. It's entirely possible she was alive all of those years and met a tragic end, though. Web Sleuth users submitted her to authorities as an option. It is unknown if law enforcement responded to their inquiries. So, as for now, we still don't know. As for what cruel fate befell Jane Doe, only suicide has officially been ruled out by police, so almost anything is possible. Everything has been suggested from an accident to human trafficking, drug overdose to murder. And unless there is a major breakthrough in this case, we may never know who Jane Doe truly is or what happened to her. 
Three years after Jane Doe's discovery, authorities felt it was time to give her a proper burial. On December 7, 2011, in overcast, cold, and windy conditions, local news, strangers, and the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Office gathered at the Cattaraugus Cemetery in Waupon, Wisconsin. Investigators who worked on the case acted as pallbearers, and David Kukla, a Patriot Guard rider, stood by, holding up an American flag as the ceremony proceeded, saying, She is still a human being. She still needs to be laid to rest with dignity and honor. The Sheriff's Department's head chaplain, Don Dyke, said, We knew this day was coming, and we were hoping beyond hope, I guess, that we would find somebody that would know her. So the department, as well as the coroner, decided to become family for her. That is really what it all boiled down to. As for the lead investigator, Jerry Kane, he believes any hope of solving Jane Doe's death lies in exposure. So spreading the word is key, as six more years have passed since her burial, and we are no closer to closure. Fond du Lac Jane Doe was anywhere from 15 to 21 years old, was possibly white, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, or biracial, and stood around 4 feet 9 inches to 5 feet 3 inches tall, weighing between 110 to 135 pounds. She had light brown to dark blonde hair that was 12 to 14 inches long with varying light and dark shades. She was found wearing a black and pink top, jeans cuffed at the bottom, and underclothing. She had dental work done to her top and bottom molars, had spina bifida occulta, possibly suffered a previous trauma to her ribs, and was pigeon-toed. If you have any information concerning Jane Doe's identity or the circumstances of her death, please contact the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Office at 920 920- 929-3388. That's 920-929-3388. Special thanks to the Patreon family. The names you see on screen are just some of the people who financially contribute to this channel. Whether they are passionate about cases like Fond du Lac, Jane Doe's, or the other dark content on this channel, their support cannot be overstated. If you are interested in supporting the channel, information is always in the description, but even if you only continue to support by watching, thank you. Thank you for giving the Fond du Lac Jane Doe a moment of your time, and a special thanks to all of the investigating bodies. No matter what you choose to believe or what you speculate, I ask you only for respect in the comments below, and though they called her Jane Doe, she deserves to reclaim her true name so that justice may be found. Thank you for watching the video and supporting this channel, as exposure to these cases is highly important. Don't forget to grab some Wendigo merchandise before the 1st of February, and my only other message is to stay safe, friends, and have a good night.